friends. Welcome back to today's episode of the Life with Loverly podcast. What's up, Michelle? Nothing much. Just trucking along this week. We got lots going on, you know? Lots of moving parts always. Yes. As soon as we think it's going to be like, okay, we got this week, we can like, (laughs) let's plan it out. You're like, okay, we're moved in. And you think it's like, check, we're done. It's like. Yeah. A lot of like moving our schedule around, changing things like meetings within the office. There's appointments. Like there's yeah. a lots of things. When things get delivered, you know, there are these huge windows you have to be available that are like, oh, we'll be there between the hours of 12 and 8. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Literally today, it's like a delivery on the calendar from 8 to 5. And I was like, can we get like a two-hour window, please? Even a four-hour window, yeah. you know? I yeah. know it's I, one thing I will say, and I really appreciate our team, um, is just like the flexibility that they yes. have given us in just this moving process. And everybody's kind of had to figure out this new way that we're communicating and where are we working from that day. Yeah. And so I really appreciate the flexibility that everyone behind the scenes at Loverly Gray and Life with Loverly has just been like given us a lot of grace, which thank you, friends. <laughs> yeah. Do you feel like you could have done this? five years ago in your business, would you have been able to handle this? No, I'd be like, I'm taking a month off (laughs) and I'm going to like call all my best friends and be like, please help me. Yeah. It's funny because I feel like I don't go really well between business and personal. And Mm -hmm. unfortunately for me, um, my like personal life is my business. It's true. So like an example of that would be if we're like traveling somewhere with my family my priority is my kids, but I, so sometimes I feel like I can't always capture like the content or the behind the scenes or, Hey, this is what I'm doing. Or here's the things that I'm loving, or this is what we packed because it's, there's just no time yeah. for that because I'm worried about like, A, the safety of my kids, like being with them. Whereas if I'm by myself or if I'm at in like work mode, it's so much easier for me to put that stuff together. But you know, people always want to see like the real life or what is it really like? Right. And for me, I just have, that's always been such a hard balance. And so I just always just choose my family or like the personal side of things. And then sometimes I don't get to share things that maybe others would like to see, but we just can't do that right now. Yeah. Like, what do you mean? It's your job. It's your full-time job. I I, th- I still think that's very funny. You get that question a lot. People yeah. don't understand well, the I, business. A lot of times I get the question of, so what is your full-time job? Yeah. And I'm like, this, <laughs> this, <laughs> this is my job. Um, I guess my full-time job isn't necessarily this podcast. No. That is an entity of the job. But running Loverly Gray and creating content and keeping my website and yeah. LTK shop and everything that we produce, that is a – full-time and then some job is actually 10 people's full-time job. It is. It really <laughs> is. mine. Uh, well, since we're kind of on that subject, today's podcast, we thought that it would be fun pulling questions that we have received through last season. I would say last season through now. Mm-hmm. People are so curious. Yeah. And we've done the business of blogging several right. times. We've done a lot of those episodes. I think this would be fun, like questions that are more relative to right now. Totally. At this point in the business. So if you guys um, are curious of just knowing the first, like the beginning stages of how she got it started and how we've grown, you can go back to episodes four, 21, 28. There's multiple episodes Mm -hmm. that are about kind of the business of blogging. So I wanted to kind of start with a then versus now. Yeah, let's do it. I think that'll be really helpful. Also, before we get into this, another podcast, Allie Reeves, she interviewed me on her podcast um, a few years ago. And I just left that podcast feeling like, oh my goodness, I wish I could put all of what I just talked about on yes. my podcast. So go back and listen to that one too, because that kind of tells my story. But there's she asks some really great questions that I think are good nuggets for people who just have more questions or who are yeah. wanting some more insight. So we'll link that episode back in the show notes as well. Great. All right. The first one is how has your taste, brand, and strategy changed from day one? to current day? Gosh. Okay. Well, day one was actually in December of 2015. I always, I'm just like, yeah, I started like January, 2016, but really I started in December. Yeah. And I remember just being like, 
I thought about it for a few weeks leading up to before I actually even posted anything. And I think it took me like forever to even come up with a name for my blog because back then you came up with like a blog name or like this like pseudo like that you were going to be going by. My last name is Shogren and it's spelled S-J-O-G-R-E-N. And that's a hard name to like, it does not look like, it doesn't sound like it's spelled. (laughs) And so I didn't just want to say like my name was Brittany Shogren, but I also wanted to start a new Instagram account because I didn't want to bombard people who I was following, like who followed me on my personal page. I just kind of want to like my own separate little thing. So it took me a little while to figure out my name, which is Loverly Gray. And that honestly came from like just brainstorming things. And I wanted to name, like bring my dog, who's a gray Weimaraner. Her name's Birdie. I was like, how could I like bring her into this. So I went with gray. My favorite color is gray. I really like gray, like neutrally tones. And then I was like, what's another word for love, loverly gray. It just kind of flowed together. So that's how that came about. That took me a while to even get to day one of posting. Yeah. And so then I started just like, I mean, I think I, my first post was like a terrible flat lay. <laughs> You know, I was just like, gotta start somewhere. Yes. I mean, we used to do flat lays all the time where you would just kind of like lay your clothes. And it's so funny. Somebody, one of my friends was like, yeah, my mom is always like, she does these really cute photos where like the clothes are laying there, but like no body is is wearing them. (laughs) And I'm like, yeah, flat lay. Yeah. (laughs) You were able to get all the accessories in there and kind of show it all in one picture. Exactly. And I really didn't know what I was doing when Mm -hmm. I first started. I was working my corporate job. I wanted to like share my workwear finds. I was sharing them with my office. A few friends really encouraged me. Why don't you just like look at this girl who's doing it? Like you could definitely do that and talk about workwear, talk about affordable finds. So I kind of just like took a leap and went for it, but I didn't know what I was doing. I feel like I learned every day. I got better every day. Um, But I would say a lot of my taste is probably very similar um, my brand has just grown and has like built on that foundation. I think some of that foundation has always been like hard work mm-hmm. and dedication, um, and like using my sales culture background and sales, just treating my page is like a service, but it's like it's providing a service for somebody, but it's also for me to make a sale. Yeah. And that's like how a business is run here. Mm-hmm. So I I mean, I feel like a lot of the fundamental things I started on, I'm still doing. It's just kind of at a bigger level, if that yeah. makes sense. I think I could even say one thing is your style mm-hmm. has always been it hasn't been super trendy. You keep up with the trends, but not right. fall into those heavy, like trendy situations. And it's a classic look. Totally. I think a lot of even we've talked about kind of pulling from the vault, so mm-hmm. to speak, of outfits that I wore and then like showing how I would restyle those same like looks together. One thing I did a ton back then, especially for workwear, was like mixing patterns. Mm-hmm. I was always doing like a leopard print and a stripe together, or florals and stripes together, polka dots and florals, like just showing people outfit ideas that were fun and bright and like- Not your typical like workwear, black, yeah. white, and khaki. Like yeah. how can we show some personality here? Yeah. So I thought that was really fun. And then I think just always like helping people Mm -hmm. feel good when they're getting dressed. Like somebody messaged me yesterday actually and said that they bought a jumpsuit that I shared. They were wearing it that day and that they just felt like so beautiful and like they had this confidence. And so they just were like, thank you for, you know, sharing this with me because I feel so great today. Mm -hmm. And that's to me, that one message is like worth the whole share. <laughs> the whole you know? table when we were at our meeting, we were all like, oh. Yeah, <laughs> you know, and it just like makes you feel good. That's something I recommended is is like something people could actually mm-hmm. get and wear and it looks good on them and they can wear it multiple times. And so yeah. I think all of those things have really stayed the same. Yeah. What does your typical work week look like then versus now? Do you feel like you work the same amount of hours? Has that changed? So then I was working a full-time job. When I first started out, was working full-time for the first year in sales. It was very like I had a 
a great sales job. Mm -hmm. Um, And I was working a lot at night, like writing blog posts. You know, I would like bundle, take pictures on the weekends. And then like, so it was a lot of after hours because I had another job. And then after I convinced Chris to let me quit my job and just do the blog full time, even though he was like, this seems to be like a crazy financial loss, but like, sure. Yeah. (laughs) Um, I was, I definitely had to figure out a routine, but I still kind of ran my days like I was going to work, even though I was working at home. But I had to structure myself that was like, okay, I have to wake up at a certain time. Yeah. I have to start doing this at a certain time. Um, or else I would look down and be like, it's 12 o'clock and I'm still in my pajamas and haven't showered because I've just been like, you know, right. doing research on Instagram or whatnot. Whereas now, um, we definitely run this more of like a corporate office on the backside. Like uh, my employees work eight to five, Mm -hmm. Monday through Friday. Um, I come into the office two days a week. We work for my house two days a week. I have a day off in the week. Um, There's some like minimal weekend work, but we're trying to even like restructure the way that use some like platforms to help us push out content so that people are able to have breaks. Um, but I, I think there was a period where I went from being part-time in the beginning to full-time to very Mm full-time over like maybe closer to like 60 or 70 hours a week because it was just, I was doing everything. And then once I started hiring help, I was eventually able to like go to where I have a day off in the week or Mm -hmm. I work out you know, certain times I don't come in until later certain days. So I've definitely gotten more of a, of a flow down, but I think because of the help I have now, I am able to have like less hours than what I used to. Right. Right. Do you, did you realize that you would become as big as you are today? No, I had no idea what I was getting myself into. You know, I mean, I just wanted to share outfits. I just wanted to encourage people. Um, Nobody was really sharing like sale finds back then. So that was like a unique about me. And then another unique was trying on the clothes and like talking through the fit and the style and like, does it have pockets? Like here's the material. Oh, you'll need to wear like nude undergarments because it's see-through or a slip or whatever. But like Basically, I thought I wanted to be the try-on for somebody so they wouldn't have to return it. Like yeah. I was giving them everything they need to know so like their return like chance would be less. So to me, I was just like doing all this stuff kind of like hoping to help a friend. Never in my wildest dreams did I think I would like even hit a million followers on Instagram, mm-hmm. you know, hit like some really great – business like financial goals that we've been able to hit over the years, have a team of people supporting me, like starting separate businesses from this. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think kind of where we are now, I'm like, we're just getting started. Yeah, Like it feels like we could go out and do a few other things, major things. And it's because of just everything that has gone into it from like up to this point. Was there an obstacle in the beginning of blogging that you thought you would never be able to overcome? Um, I feel like I, you know, Instagram is where a lot of this like started. I had a web, I have a website and write blogs, but you kind of needed a, some social platform to like push it out. Yes. I have an email list and you know, there's Facebook, Instagram, Um, but you needed like a platform to push out, but like you don't control anything on these platforms. You know, it's Instagram. We always are like, they have a mind of their own today. Like, Oh, if, if they're shut down, like you can't talk to your customers. Yeah. And so sometimes those became just pain points or if Instagram was making a change, then we were like all having to be figure out, okay, well now what are we going to do? Or, and I think some of those were just so out of my control and I just didn't really know what to expect, but you just kind of have to roll with it. So that was definitely something that I was kind of like, okay, I'm not really, I'm at the mercy of some other platform, but we also put things into place that 
God forbid Instagram does shut down, like you can always find everything on my website. You can join my email list where we send out emails every week with like specific email content of style tips and advice and outfits, you know, so there's other places we've created. And I think it's good to have all like not all your eggs in one basket, but have like multiple ways that people can reach you. Yeah. Um, No matter what your business is, if it's, you know, as an influencer or some other brand, but those those were definitely some struggles that I was just like, how do we even navigate this? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. This is a little bit more personal on being a content creator. I think a lot of people are very curious how like the business model works within an influencer's, you know, job. So what does a collab look like, which is a collaboration working with another brand. <laughs> yeah. So a collaboration would be, we kind of come to a collaboration a few different ways. Um, one way would be that the brand reaches out to me and says, Hey, we seen what you've done and we would like to partner with you. Like here's a scope of work. Here's, we would like for you to create one reel, one set of Instagram stories. Um, here are the like FTC requirement tags, which is like, Technically, since I get paid to do these partnerships, I have to disclose that. And if I don't disclose that, I could get fined. Um, so th- here's like a list of what all those are. And this is the amount that we're going to pay you for this. And in exchange w- with the payment, we'll also send you a gift card to like purchase the outfit that you want to share, or whatever. So that might be one way. And they reach out to my brand management team which I didn't always have at one point. It was just me, you know, and I would be like receiving these emails and then I'd complete the collaboration. I have to like send them an invoice and they're, uh, you know, I mean, there was just a lot of back and forth just on that side alone. Right. Forget Um, the content creation. (laughs) Exactly. So now I have a brand management company and they kind of handle all the negotiations. Um, Allie is my manager and she's amazing and will, you know, she – gets emails all the time that are like, Hey, we want to work with Brittany. Like, here's our thoughts. And she'll say, okay, well for that, here's, here's her rate. Here's her schedule. Um, this is like, she only feels comfortable doing this or what you're asking for is out of the question. Sometimes it's a no, sorry, we can't make it work. Mm -hmm. Other times it's a, okay, great. Like we've got availability. Let's go. Um, and then there's times where I will, be shopping or I'll be looking for something and I'm like, ooh, this is really cool. I have a great idea with this. I wonder if the brand would want to partner. Mm -hmm. And so then I would tell Allie, hey, I'm really loving this, you know, dress. I've got an event coming up. Can we reach out to this brand and see if they would be interested in partnering on a collaboration? And so then she would reach out and kind of start the conversation that way. And um, so it can kind of work a few different ways, but I would say that is the main way like working with a collaboration is. And a lo- I, I probably do between like 15 mm-hmm. and 25 collaborations mm-hmm. a month, depending on the month, depending on like what it is. Sometimes the requirement is like in feed, sometimes it's stories, sometimes it just kind of like it can totally depend on month to month. Yeah. Well, with that being said, people are so curious. Do you purchase all of the product, which I know you kind of covered that, and or do you keep all of it? <laughs> yes. So it really depends. I I do purchase a lot just because I find joy in shopping and I Aside from like collaborations, I like to just create content that feels really organic to me that feels like a lot of the times when I'm doing question boxes, like what are you guys wanting to see? That's me gathering ideas to go purchase that content. If it can be made into a collaboration, that's great too. Um, But I like to do a lot of like styling So I personally am just shopping and I know like not every brand has budget to work with me every time I want to like share a reel or share a piece of clothing. And so I don't expect that. Um, I do get paid also from affiliate links. Mm -hmm. So anytime people shop through the LTK app or through my Amazon store, there's trackable links. And those kind of just work the same way if you were to go into a department store and like work with a sales associate, they get a percentage of that commission. It's usually a very small percentage. Most I would say are under 10%. Some go up to 20%, just really varies across 
the brands and across like what the items even are at a brand. Um, so I do purchase a lot myself. Um, I do receive gifting from brands. Like sometimes like Cleabella is a great example. I absolutely love the brand Cleabella. They're a women owned dress company. Um, they use like ethically sourced products. Every, like a lot of their cotton is organic, mm -hmm. a lot like giving back. They hire a lot of women to like sew the dresses from other countries. It's just a really great company. And then their like silhouettes are beautiful. The price point is a little bit higher, but they are a brand that they're like, hey, we would love to gift you a few pieces from our upcoming launch. Like, look at this line sheet and let us know what you want. And I found myself like working those pieces into so many things that I do because I just genuinely love them. Mm -hmm. So we have things that I buy. We have things that get gifted to me. Um, and then like things that are – part of a collaboration that are the brand is like, here's a gift card to use this product or we will send you these products. So um, as far as keeping everything, I wish I could keep everything. <laughs> I mean, realistically, it's just, it doesn't make sense. Um, I also don't want anybody to ever think that they need to buy everything that I'm posting. Um, I think you can curate a closet that has a lot of really solid pieces in it that you can rewear and then occasionally like refresh and add things to it. Part of my job is showing outfits and showing ideas. So I just naturally like that's part of my business. We'll have more clothes to be able to do that. Um, so the clothes that I – we usually kind of, we have like kind of a process if it's out of stock it makes it hard to like wear on a story or in a reel because then people are like well i really wanted that blue dress and it's like oh sorry it's out of stock like that's never a great experience yeah. for a shopper to be shown something that they can't have same goes for if i'm talking on stories and i'm like not even sharing anything about my clothes but people are just like what is that shirt i mm -hmm. need i need i need for me to be like oh sold out like sorry is a missed opportunity, but then it is also kind of like if somebody realizes I'm a shopping platform, but they're never actually able to shop <laughs> yeah. anything I'm wearing or showing, that's going to frustrate them. Yeah. So I try to show things and wear things. Obviously, there are pieces in my closet that I love. They're not available anymore. I wear them behind the scenes like – if I'm doing something that I'm not really showing on Instagram, a lot of the times it's like those pieces. But if something is out of stock, um, if it didn't fit me like properly, a lot of – most every time I will say like this doesn't fit me, you can see, you know, those are things I'm not going to keep if mm -hmm. it doesn't fit. Um, so I will return those if possible. But a lot of times I just put things on our Poshmark account where we sell to whoever is wanting to buy it, which a lot of times is people who either want it at a, like a discounted price or they didn't get an opportunity to buy it because it sold out when they first showed it. Um, and then we donate all of the proceeds. 100% of what we make from our Poshmark gets donated to charity every month. We usually pick a different charity. A lot of times we've asked like the girls in the office, like what charity should we donate this to this month? Um, so that's a great way I feel like we're giving back. And especially because I'm not always buying the clothes like a lot can mm -hmm. get gifted to me and so I don't personally want to just bank on that you know everybody does whatever they feel led to do but so that's kind of how I am able to like recycle but still give back by doing that a lot of people wanted to know why they are seeing a lot of different influencers sharing the same thing on the same days Yes. So sometimes brands will have like a drop for a new product and they will offer collaborations to several influencers. They are scheduled to post at the same time on the same day because that's the brand's way of getting it in front of way more eyes than if they just worked with one person on that day to do a drop. Or maybe even getting multiple views throughout the day, throughout those multiple platforms. Exactly. Yeah. So it's a brand strategy. Sometimes it can look inauthentic from a reader who doesn't understand like that that's a brand strategy. Yeah. I mean, it's very similar to the way that, you know, commercials are run yeah. on TV. They might, you know, one brand might put their same commercial across like several different channels because they know they're going to capture the eye on all of these different channels. Mm -hmm. And they're going to tailor it too to the influencer that their audience is – the shopper of XYZ product. Mm -hmm. So 
sometimes you can get like I've negotiated some exclusivity or I've said like, can I have, can I make this like feel a little bit better for my customers to be able to shop at first? Could I post a day before? Could I get an hour early or something? Um, but it just really depends. But usually it's like for a brand's um, launch and that's why it's happened on the same day. Okay. These are a little bit more of CEO leadership questions. Okay. What is the best investment that you've made into yourself that has overflowed into your CEO work? I would say probably weekly therapy. Yeah. Um, I've been talking with a life coach every week for the past two and a half years. And I feel like I've gained a lot of clarity. I've gained a lot of just like wisdom, um, clear vision for my brand. Um, I think that would probably be the best. I mean, working with Jen is definitely a, like sometimes our conversations are more personal, like things happening in my personal life that I'm dealing with. Sometimes it's more things like happening in my business life or in my work life. But she's really been able to like help me step into like the best CEO version of myself that I just – I mean, I I never expected to be a CEO. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I mean, and it's weird to say, but like, it, this is just where I'm at. Um, and so having some of the tools that she's really helped me with has been like an amazing investment. Yeah. I feel like you kind of covered this, but are there any routines that have helped you get to your best CEO self? Um, I think definitely that conversation with Jen, um, even things like, scheduled working out. Like yeah. I have, like I work out with a personal trainer two times a week and just knowing that that is on my schedule, that that is going to be like for me, but then I'm a better version of myself for my team. Mm -hmm. Um, last year I started working with a dietitian and just even got my like health underway. I didn't even realize, you know, I was running on, you know, something not very good for breakfast, running on coffee throughout the day, coffee in the afternoon, <laughs> not enough protein. Yeah. You know, so then I'm going into these meetings tired or just not even like full, mm -hmm. but I've been so busy going back to back, doing all these things that I wasn't properly fueled. So even some simple things like that. Um, and then of course, just like listening to different podcasts and reading some books that have helped like line up just the C like helping me like set myself up for success as a CEO. Yeah. I would say those are probably a few. Yeah. What's the one challenge that you didn't expect being a CEO? Um, I didn't, sometimes I have a problem between like wanting to be really creative and be my creative self. Cause to me, that's where I thrive. I'm like, I just want to get in my closet. I just want to style outfits. But then I ha I'm running a business, yeah. so I have to like be back over with my team, answering questions, just talking through, getting all of the ideas out on paper, delegating. You know, I mean, we always joke like nobody can read my mind, so I have to physically like say, here's the problem or here's like the solution to that problem. But that takes me away from being creative. So there's been a lot of times where I'm like, well, I can't. I can't do like have conversations with them if I'm not like creating because the, like creating is what is like allowing us to even have some of these conversations. So yeah. finding that balance and honestly hiring people to help me with that. Um, we've got some really amazing people in on our team right now who can really help me run the business so I can stay over mm -hmm. in this really creative area. But I mean, Nichelle knows – that was definitely a pain point for probably a few years, just figuring that out. Yeah. Um, so that was something I was just like not sure how to even do. I think that also just so you guys know that – one side of the business is not just necessarily like being with the team. It's operations. Yeah. It is a very black and white, sometimes gray, I guess, because it is a different kind of business. But in any of these companies that you do see on commercials, think of those businesses behind the scene are having, we're having to function the same way. Mm -hmm. So we have people that, you know, are in charge of the brand collabs and negotiating with the, you know, management team. We have people who are helping come up with, you know, ideas for X platform because we are running on many platforms. Mm -hmm. It's not just Instagram. There are so many logistics. Yeah. That that's why it is so hard. It's 
a different part of your brain that gets used than the creative side. And so many times like we'll be in just this creativity, we're filming reels, we're putting outfits together. And then like Chris comes in and he's like, Hey, I have some questions. Like here's some things and it's operational related, but we have to kind of stop, Mm -hmm. think about that. That takes away from what we're doing. And it's just like the flipping your brain on and off to Mm -hmm. those two sides can be then hard to jump back into. Yeah. You you lose valuable time a lot of times because it like your brain takes time. Yeah. Yeah. So really learning how to schedule certain conversations, how to, you know, run things on one side so that when I am away, the structure is set really nicely. Um, But I think that's something I'll probably just be trying to figure out for a while. Um, But it was something I just didn't really expect. Yeah. So this is a lot more to do with your team. So Mm -hmm. delegation, things like that, which I think is always fun to kind of see what's hard for people to let go. (laughs) I know. So how, when or what to delegate? How did you decide what you absolutely needed to delegate when it came to your team? Um, Delegating is hard because I'm such a like Enneagram three. (laughs) I'm just like, well, I'll just do it and it'll be done the right way. Right. You know, and then on the flip side of that, it's like, well, what if I taught somebody to do it the right way? And then I had all this other It frees you later. Yeah. <laughs> so I listened – somebody that I know took this business class a few years ago. And I was asking her, how's the class going? It was like a business for entrepreneurs. It was a class. And um, she said, "I we got some really great advice in the session today. They talked about as a CEO, you need to give yourself like an hourly salary. And like, so let's for easy math, just say like your hourly salary or your hourly rate is going to be $100 an hour. So look at the tasks that you have to do in this hour. Is this worth $100 Mm -hmm. or is it worth like $25 an hour? Or like what tasks are taking up your time? Are they the like lower tasks that somebody you could delegate, you could teach somebody to do them, and then you could put your your hourly rate into these other tasks that really only you can do. Mm -hmm. And so once I started thinking that, I was like, okay. Like there immediately became a list of things that I was like, I like doing this, but I could teach somebody else who's better at it than I am. And I can pass that off. It also helped, I think, clarity in knowing when to hire. Totally. Um, I mean, I even just remember like your first few weeks, Mm -hmm. like you were like, please let me help you. What else can I take on? Yeah. What else? And I was like, no, it's fine. Like, I'll do this. I'll do this. It's, I'll do this. It's I'll funny because you know what the next question is. What was the hardest task to delegate? <laughs> uh, I don't know. What would you say? Because you are on the other side. I, I mean, your baby. Yeah. Like you you had 620 something thousand followers whenever I started. And Instagram, I think, was the hardest. It was kind of like I don't want that on your phone because then you're going to, you know, you might, you might need to use it outside. And I don't really, you know, yeah. you know, so I mean, giving over Instagram and just like access and having somebody like post on my behalf. I yeah. mean, I still am like, no, I'll just like post. Yeah. And the girls are like, but we can make this so much easier for like you've already everyone. created it. All we have to do is push it out. Like, yes. yeah. Um, and I just still like that, like hand on things. Yeah. But I think I'm getting a little bit more like, yeah, you know, and messages is so hard to, I love like reading them and responding to people, Mm -hmm. but a lot come in that I just can't get to. Yeah. It's physically impossible to get through one person to get through the amount of messages that you get in a day. So obviously you do need help on that, on that end. And I think that you've kind of realized that, but have you dropped it completely? Not yet. (laughs) (laughs) Still working through it. Working through it. How do you give your employees feedback? What's your preferred style? Um, I think just like being honest and open and um, coming from a place of love, you know, and Mm -hmm. like kindness. And I just think of like, how would I want to be talked to in this situation? Um, Sometimes that is a hard conversation, Mm -hmm. especially I don't like conflict. Like I would rather, I'm like, "Eh, it's fine. Like that didn't really hurt my feelings. (laughs) I'll just tuck that deep down and be thinking about it for you know, days on end, but that's not healthy. Um, So I think just like really trying to, if I always say like nothing that can happen is going to be like life 
threatening. Right. You know, if somebody makes a mistake, we can change it. Yeah. Um, you know, we're always like, no one has ever gotten fired for like posting the wrong thing. No. You know, it's just not, while it is very serious, I think we just, I just want to be a leader that leads with kindness, who is, um, be leading by example. So I think trying to just be open, um, and have those honest conversations, even when they can be hard, mm-hmm. it doesn't have to be mean. No. If you need to have like a second set of ears, like overhearing the conversation, so like nothing can be taken out of context later, mm-hmm. that's always a great thing to do. I mean, running a business, hard conversations are going to have to happen. Yeah. Um, conversations where you have to fire people are going to have to happen. Mm-hmm. Conversations where people will come to you and quit because they've got another job offer or they don't think this is a good fit for them will have to happen. And those are uncomfortable but you can get through it. Yeah. Um, I think we've learned if anything, number one, if you let it go too long, it festers and it gets worse. But yep. number two, you only get closer and stronger the more conversation that you do have. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So it's definitely something I've had to learn and get better at. Again, didn't think I would mm-hmm. be doing those type of things. But yeah, I I just think trying to be a good leader and being open and allowing the allowing my employees a place where they they can come and talk to me without me just being like, well, I can't believe you think that, you know, and letting them – giving them a place to listen is important too. Yeah. How do you know what to pay your employees? Um, we look a lot of like what is – industry standards yeah. or like, not even industry because well, research like, we have to do yeah. a lot of research do a lot of like <laughs> what's the going rate for this type of job yeah or management level jobs like here's what's going on um one thing i would say like i'm very thankful and, and proud i feel like all of our employees have great salaries. We do a lot of just bonus opportunities throughout the year. If there's events or things that happen that it's like, wow, that was really amazing. Like Chris will bonus out. Mm -hmm. Um, And then just like offering growth potential. Mm -hmm. Like we, I think almost everybody who's for sure, everybody who's been here for a year or more has received like a raise, if not multiple raises, just depending on like where, but we just go, what is like the standard rate? Also, like that's something that's really important is I want the really great people to want to stay here, yeah. you know? So I think we have some really great incentives, but that was, that's all like come with time. Mm-hmm. Um, and it comes, experience is another, mm-hmm. I think, key point. Totally. If this person comes with massive experience, then it's like, we definitely, we, we value that. Yeah. So we- We value experience. We value just like the hard work that our people do. So I think it's important to show them that and and find out kind of like what they're motivated by. And if receiving, you know, monetary, uh, you know, adjustments in your salary, then that's like a great goal to work towards. Okay. So when it comes to organization, like the logistics of the business, what tools do you use that you, that keep you organized? Um, to a lot of my employees, like (laughs) dismay, I love the notes app. She does. (laughs) We are working away from it. Um, but we've got some really great platforms like monday.com. It's literally the back end of the business can live in monday.com. So all tasks, anything coming up, our content calendar, all the brand collabs, everything everything. we're doing. Um, Another similar one would be like Asana, if you've ever heard of that. Mm -hmm. But we also use Later, which is a social media kind of like management tool where you can schedule things and kind of view, get a plan for your week using the content calendar. We have like physical calendars in our office that cat keeps up to date with like brand collaborations, podcast recordings, when podcasts are going live. Um, we kind of use some of those things like across all of our platforms, but Google Docs, Google Sheets, like I mean, I think there's so many just different platforms, especially that y'all are even using more than I am. Yeah, agree. How do you structure your week? I think this is really we actually just talked about this this morning. We're going to try to restructure structure it, but I think that a lot of people would not know about 
like our meetings and stuff. Yeah. So we have a Monday meeting every Monday. Um, we come in, we get set, we have a, this meeting that's usually about an hour and this is where we go over reports. We talk about, um, the numbers from last week. We see things that performed well. We see things that didn't perform well. We look at growth. We, and we do this across all of our platforms. And this is an opportunity for everybody to talk on the platform that they are supporting. So it gives um, everybody an opportunity to give, kind of present what they've been working on, what they've been doing. And we have discussion time. We've got brainstorming. Um, we go over offers. We get up together a plan of like what is to come for that week. A lot of times we have like an overarching plan for the month, but we – Monday mornings are like non-negotiable. Mm -hmm. Like those meetings are like, that's a must be at. And then we have brainstorming meetings throughout the week, just with different like sets of teams. Um, and some are mandatory and some are, you know, kind of can be a little bit flexible, but really scheduling it and running the back end for like consistency mm -hmm. for the team, I think is really important. Keeps everybody on track. So how often do you work on your business plan and where do you see yourself in 10 years or LG in 10 years? I, I mean, I think we're kind of, we probably sit down, like try to once a year, mm -hmm. once a quarter and really talk through like, what is the goal? What are the plans? Like, um, I, I do think and Nichelle and I have these conversations a lot more like off the record of yeah. just like, ooh, we should do this or yeah. ooh. You know, I always joke that now we've moved into our house. I'm like, what project are we picking up next? Like, <laughs> you know, I've got like just wait. <laughs> 10 things happening behind the behind the scenes that I'm like, okay, ready to like activate this. Yeah. You know? <laughs> um, in 10 years, I see Loverly Gray. Um, I guess I can share kind of like where – like some bigger goals. Mm -hmm. um, I think we will be kind of in other realms. Um, I would love to have a consulting company mm -hmm. where I am consulting influencers and like teaching them how to – do what I do. I would love to consult with brands on how to work with influencers. It's crazy how many emails that I receive that I'm like, gosh, if only like they would have said, given this information, they didn't include this. Like, yeah, I, I feel like, you know, there's so much value and knowledge I have that I want to share with other people yeah. so that they can be successful in their business. So I definitely think having some type of consulting brand, um, I I think we will have more real estate. There's mm -hmm. a lot of like fun ideas we have. I mean, we have the house that we rent on 30A, but past that, I've got so many ideas of how we could really tailor and give people like a Loverly Gray experience yeah. at some of these um, real estate locations, not even just in 30A, but like kind of across a lot of areas. Um, and then I think there's like a lot of opportunity for clothing brands, clothing lines. Um, you know, we're sort of exploring that with a few things that we're going to be doing later this year in the beginning of next year. So we'll kind of really get like a good taste on that. But I definitely think, you know, I mean, I haven't even told you this yet, but like uh -oh. <laughs> lately I've been like really wanting to like get into flowers, like okay. have some type of like. Like, I'm like, what if we started like a Loverly Gray, like flower brand? I mean, I love that. We always talk about wanting live flowers yeah. all the time. You know, and I mean, I have this amazing garden at my house that I like have all of these flowers. I'm just like, what if this like was something? So if something like that actually happens, TBD. you guys uh, <laughs> heard it here first. <laughs> I love that. So that's the next thing after the moving's over. Yeah, right. <laughs> All right. The next is social media related. Okay. All right. How do you block out the noise? Put on your blinders mm -hmm. with everything that's going on in the social media world. This is a hard one. I'll be honest. Um, there's. It's so easy to scroll and be like, oh, wow, look what she's doing. Oh, Wow that looks so good on her. Mm -hmm. I have that, you know, like just what are other people doing? Oh, they're doing better than me, mm -hmm. you know? And I'll be honest, I think for me personally, I get these feelings. 
of just, I'm not good enough. I am like, this other person is better than me because of like how they're thriving. And I know that is like the devil trying to come into my life and say, you're not good enough. Like Mm -hmm. see what she's doing over there. And so I really have to nip it. Um, There have been times where I've had to like mute people that I've followed on Instagram because I'm like, it's just not healthy for me to like have these feelings. I love the people as as, as people, but you know, for whatever reason, I get triggered by something I'm seeing and that's just not healthy. And that goes for like anything. If you yeah. follow somebody that you're like, this is not bringing me joy. Yeah. I'm not finding inspiration with this. Then it's okay to mute yeah. them unfollow them, do whatever you need to do to like be in your healthy zone. But I think really remembering what I am here for. We've got core values. We have a vision. So if we ever are questioning or ever in a time where we're like not sure of ourselves, we go back to what those core values are and what that vision is. And that's what brings us back. That's what keeps Mm -hmm. our blinders on, which I think if you have a clear purpose, a clear vision for what you're doing, and you really believe in that, you can stay in your lane and you can do what your audience loves. Um, And that's not to say don't try new things, but you don't have to worry about what others are doing. You can confidently do what you're doing and know that that's like your true self. Yeah. Do you ever get tired of social media? Sometimes. Um, I sometimes have like my, some of my friends gave up social media for Lent and I was like, gosh, I wish I could do that. <laughs> you know, like yeah. I just, for me, cause every time I'm on there, it's an opportunity for research. It's an opportunity yeah. to like see shop if I'm like looking at a brand's page. Um, and so I don't necessarily use it as just like a mindless scrolling. Yeah. Like I, you know, So sometimes I wish I could get rid of it, but I try to have like healthy boundaries Mm -hmm. and be like, okay, I'm going to put my phone down or I'm not going to turn it on until – I'm not going to open up social media until a certain time in the morning. Yeah. Um, But sometimes I'm like, a break would be nice. Yeah. I think everyone probably feels that way. And I can't imagine being obviously in your role, but even just from it's – I mean, it was part of my job too to research what's going on out there. I literally had to turn – like a timer on on my yeah. phone and I have to put it down at eight o'clock at night. Yeah. I only intentionally pick it back up because I would get sucked into myself and it's like, you just feel, you start to feel right. really gross about, you know what I mean? Like, right. Or you look up and you're like, okay, well now I have to get back to my life. An and hour and I a half just, later. Yeah. I just yeah. wasted time and now I have to clean or now I yes. have to do whatever, you know? So I think there's, we really need to encourage healthy boundaries yes. there um, because I think it's only getting crazier. Yeah. How do you stay inspired despite the challenges of like fast fashion, like thoughts? Um, I think I just, I have a very classic style, a very like age appropriate style. I'm 35, but I feel like my taste really is for somebody who's 20 to 60. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, a lot of people my mom's age are even following and they are like, okay, this is crazy. This works for me and you. Um, So I think just really investing in pieces that are you you can get great quality at an affordable price point i think the 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 thing that is good with fast fashion is you get the opportunity to try out a trend that maybe you wouldn't be 100 percent sure of if you were investing in it from like a designer or higher price point do i think there are ways to recycle your clothes properly or you know so you're not just like getting all the stuff all the time. And I do think there is a way to do it, but I think this is where you just kind of have to spend time with your closet, with yourself and like figuring out what your style is and then getting those pieces that are going to really work for you. Mm -hmm. Um, So I do think there can be challenges, but if you put a little bit of time and effort into it, then you can nail that down and then you won't be you won't feel like you need to buy every like new arrival that comes out at Target, you know, or you're going to be like secure in what your taste is or what your style is. So you can add those things in as you need, but it doesn't have to be like just every trendy thing that ever happened. Yeah. Okay. For those who want to start into this business, what are four ways that somebody could grow followers and feel like it's not a waste? Um, I would say posting consistently, um, even if that's just 
if you want to start out being like, okay, I'm going to post like in my feed Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and I'm going to post stories, like three stories every day. You know, once people start following you, they're going to expect to see that same type of content from you. Um, you know, so if you post something and it goes viral, like those followers are now going to want to see the same content as like what goes viral. Yeah. So if you're like posting a funny video, that's what goes viral. All these people come to your platform and then they start seeing outfits, but you're, there's no humor. Mm -hmm. They're going to be like, well, okay, who is this person I'm yeah. following? Unfollow. So I would just say like showing up consistently, um, having like identifying what your why is behind your posting because that's going to help you consistently post. Um, I would say using the tools like within Instagram, like – using the gifts, using the music, using the features that they offer. Um, they encourage that and they promote those posts where you're actually like using all of the tools within like the posting apps. So give those a try. Mm -hmm. um, all of the features that they offer, they want you to use those. And I would also say using hashtags um, – and not just like super broad ones, like doing some research on ones that have like under 1 million posts or less, really mm -hmm. even in the like 1,000 or um, 100,000 to like 500,000 views are like a really sweet spot. Um, Let's see, growing followers. I mean, I think it's always great to like do shares with other people who you think is similar to you, um, reaching out to them and being like, hey, want to do some type of like story share where I share my favorite target finds and you share your favorite target finds and we like tell our audience to go back and forth to both or hey, like my friend Taryn and I, we used to sh like get one item and style it a few different ways. She had a different body type than I did. So we were both styling a piece, sharing each other's profile, and then, um, you know, our followers were kind of like crossing over at that point. I would stick away from doing crazy giveaways that it's like, you know, partnering with all these people because then like people are just going to want you to give them stuff all the time. <laughs> yeah. I do think it's great to do giveaways where you're just giving back to your followers. Yeah. I absolutely love that. And I will from time to time partner with people to do some type of giveaway, but not – I wouldn't suggest that as a way to just like grow your following exclusively. Yeah. All right. So wrapping up, how do you stay motivated? Um, I'm really passionate about my why. I love styling outfits. I love helping people. Um, I mean, back to when I was in high school and it was like, what do you want to do? What do you want to study? What do you want to be? I always have said, like, I want to help people. I thought for a long time that was going to be like medical industry or some like established industry. I didn't realize I could pair getting dressed and styling clothes with helping people. And so to me, I just, I love... I'm doing that for myself. I'm putting outfits together for myself. And then so many things, you know, I was talking with Kat here and she was like, people just don't even know you could have added a belt to that. And it made that like a whole different thing. Like you share so many of those like ways to elevate your outfits that I think like I wouldn't even know to like have a skinny belt on hand. And this is like the five purposes it could serve besides just wearing as a belt. Mm -hmm. So I think sharing those tips and tricks with people make me really happy. So I think that definitely motivates me to continue showing up. I mean, I love the people that I work with. I love the community that we've created. So for me, it just kind of feels like if I'm like have to work, it might as well be something that I love and something I'm super passionate about. And fortunately, like I'm able to do that. Yeah. All right. Last question. If you could give yourself one piece of advice when you started out, what would it be? Don't worry so much. Um, I would also have hired help sooner. I would have hired more help sooner. I hired my first employee my second full year in the business, and that was great. But I think I I did not know what being a boss was like. There were a lot of things that we just – I think I could have done differently to support her better. I could have stood up for myself a little bit more um, to, you know, I mean, you just, I didn't know. Yeah. I mean, I was being a manager for the first time and luckily she and I are still really great friends, <laughs> but I would have hired a lot. Like it, when you think you need help, hire somebody. Yeah hire somebody and start training them and start teaching them mm -hmm. and start documenting that process and writing the 
things down um, so you have a disaster recovery plan in yes. case it doesn't work out. Um, I think I would have told myself to like go for it, just like not like think around on certain things mm. too often, like just go follow your dreams, like just do it, not overthink it. I think I spent a lot of time overthinking things that I was like, look back now and I'm like, I could have like, <laughs> that's so silly. Yeah. Um, yeah, I feel like those are probably the main, main few things, but definitely getting help earlier. Yeah. will just help you be successful earlier. Yeah. I still feel like we have so many questions we could cover on this topic and I'm sure we will. Well, again. and maybe from this, if there's something that you want to get into that you didn't hear, please email us, please send us a message on Instagram. And if we feel like we can, um, pull together a second version of this, you know, a part two of mm -hmm. this episode, we will definitely do that. I am happy to share. I love talking with other influencers, other business owners about how to grow your business. Um, I love giving advice on just what we've done, what has worked, what hasn't worked. I think one thing about this industry, it can feel very lonely because there's not like a handbook on how to do it. Yeah. So we're really paving the way for everything and leaning into other people um, who are in this same industry that you can trust, I think is really important. So that would be some advice. Like if like find another business owner, entrepreneur that you know, and just brainstorm, ask them questions, bounce ideas off of them. Um, so I, I do think we could offer some more information, but would love to get y'all's um, questions or if there's anything that this has spawned, happy to continue this conversation. Awesome. All right, friends. Well, we love you and we're so thankful for you guys tuning in. Um, until next time. <laughs> <laughs>